Hi Gameology, my name is David. I'm an F-35C Lightning II pilot in the Navy, and today we're gonna play Ace Combat 7. Yep, so there's the F-104 that uh, we saw in the cutscene. As you can see, just high speed, not much maneuverability or uh, stability. And F-16, Fun and Falcon, or like the Air Force guys like to call it, the uh, Viper, more of a multi-role aircraft. It's still pretty fast, just not as fast as the uh, F-104, but you can see um, the air air roll increases. I'm surprised that the air ground isn't and then for loadout. I don't think it really carries 2400 bullets and it's uh, M61, the Gatling gun. It's a 20 millimeter gun. And then MSL, I'm assuming that's missiles. <laughs> it's definitely not as many as it carries. Or special weapon, target air missile. Okay. Favorite aircraft right now to fly would be Toss up between uh, F-18E Super Hornet, so single seat uh, Super Hornet, and then the F-35 I'm flying now. They both have their pluses and minuses. The F-35 has way more advanced technology than the Super Hornet. I think the Super Hornet's a little, probably more fun to fly, but the technology in the F-35 is a little bit better. I, I think the Super Hornet's a little more like, near and dear to my heart. So I definitely just overspeeded the gear there. So it definitely has an arcadey feel uh, to it. You can see the airspeed just ridiculously high right now at a low altitude. Uh, just completely oversped like the limits of the fuselage as well as everything else. And I mean, the aircraft never even get this fast, but uh, stuff you're seeing in terms of like, there are data links in the aircraft with a moving map display, as you kind of see in the bottom left. Some of this stuff, maybe not exactly the same, uh, does have some kind of correlation between what the game's showing in real life. And definitely a bigger type of plant is gonna take more than one missile or bullet to take it down. It really depends where you hit it. If it hits the one of the engines or it might hit a flight control surface. Again, like a bigger the plane, you think of it just more stable, at least in that regard. Just like if you have a, a ship or a building, it's gonna take more bombs or whatever to kind of kill its mobility uh, for an aircraft. I mean, you could sever hydraulic lines or something that might take a plane down, but it's not. it might not be quick. Just, it's not gonna explode. It might just kind of slowly degrade and fall apart. Unfortunately, in real life, we don't have a damage uh, percentage. Uh, like you see on the bottom right, what we do have is a warning caution panel, or depending on what platform, uh, we have an ICAW panel, the F-35, so that stands for Integrated Cautions and Warnings. And that'll essentially tell you if there's uh, anything happens, whether that's like an issue with your flight control, your engine, whether you're running out of fuel. So you can set a preset bingo uh, number, which is essentially your fuel. That'll be a signal that, hey, now it's time to return to base or head to a tanker to get gas. So I guess there's not a big worry about a clear field of fire here, but <laughs> that's definitely an issue in real life where you don't wanna be shooting into an enemy aircraft if you have friendlies flying near it as missile might potentially guide onto your ally, your wingman, et cetera. So some aircraft, depending on what systems they have on the aircraft, might actually give you a missile warning, or uh, some aircraft have a, what's called a radar warning receiver, or RWR, and that might give you an indication of when someone's uh, potentially looking at you with a radar, but other than that, it's not gonna really provide you much indication. So there's definitely some considerations, especially in uh, training, just the weather, what the cloud coverage is. So we'll have training rules that will dictate what we can do and what we can't do, depending on the weather. Something like this, where it's kind of just scattered clouds, just maneuver outside of the clouds for the most part. However, if you're actually in co combat, using the clouds as concealment is definitely a factor, at least being visually engaged. However, uh, a lot of radars can see, or most radars can see through clouds, so that's not a factor whatsoever now. Whether that you might be able to IR mask your aircraft to a certain extent. So essentially, if someone's trying to look at a heat signature, uh, whether it's the skin friction of your aircraft going through the sky, or if it's your engine, you might be able to use the cloud to kind of mask that, or at least make it more difficult to, to detect. There's definitely some considerations that are put into what's the current weather. So what I would normally be doing here is trying to roll inverted and pull, just for positive Gs are easier to handle as a pilot, and it's also easier, or the aircraft will give you more positive Gs, as in, that'll let you pull more positive Gs. So in an F-16, it gets rated up to nine positive Gs as I do like a pushover right here. Some aircraft might be rated up to negative three, negative three and a half Gs. So again, you can see that it's about a third. So the performance is significantly less. You're also getting into an issue now where we have an NIG straining maneuver if you're pulling positive G to keep the blood essentially rushing away from your brain so you don't G-lock. For negative G, we don't. there's no maneuver to keep the blood from 
essentially pulling your head, you could also pass out if that happens. So normally if I wanted to, instead of going like this in a negative G pushover, I would roll invert it and pull just to increase the performance of the aircraft. It also, it's better visibility. You have the bubble canopy like this in a F-16 or any other fighter aircraft, at least have uh, a normal canopy. So it looks like they're bringing two types of planes mainly to it. Uh, this fight is MiG-21 and the uh, T-95, so it kind of depends on, and that would be briefed in the mission brief or in uh, mission planning factors, what's going to be your priority, whether it's the fighters or the bombers. Fighters are definitely more of a threat to your aircraft. They can shoot missiles, shoot their gun at you, so they have the potential to destroy your aircraft. But at a certain point, depending what your risk level is and what they're going after, you might have a priority where you start switching to the bombers as you're trying to prevent them from blowing up something important. I definitely just flew through all this frag, especially in a single engine fighter with F-16. <laughs> I'd be extremely worried about what just happened to my aircraft in terms of any damage to the leading edge surfaces of the aircraft or uh, even worse if something has, uh, or if anything has been ingested by the engine intake and now is damage the engine and now I'm worrying about my engine either losing thrust or potentially flaming out and seizing. So if I actually lost the engine in a single engine fighter like a F-16 or in my experience, at least in the F-35, we do have procedures, um, we call them bold face, but it's emergency action procedures. So it's to intercept our best glide profile as we attempt to get the motor restarted. If the engine won't restart, then we're setting up for a flame out landing. So we'll have procedures in terms of uh, proper air speeds that will get us to our best glide ratio as we start trying to find the nearest field. If I'm somewhere at like 5,400 feet out over the open ocean with nowhere in sight, I'm mainly just trying to look to restart my engine. And if that's not gonna happen, intercepting a minimum sink airspeed or angle of attack, and that's gonna just allow me to main airborne for as long as possible as this engine starts to restart or attempts to restart and potentially find a boat. So if I jacked, I'm not worried about either freezing to death in the cold water or spending longer than I want to in a small raft that's uh, in my ejection seat. So getting picked up, whether that's by ideally a military aircraft, a helicopter, or ejected near some kind of military ship. Worst case, it'd be some kind of fishing vessel or a pleasure boat, something, and just hoping that they're aware. And again, that's something where maybe the cloud cover will come into issue if it's overcast day down down to about 200 feet, or if it's clear skies, I think it'd be readily apparent that this aircraft has just crashed into the ocean and now I'm parachuting down. So you can see there, they're just giving a brief description. There's something uh, that you might have saw where it said cloud cover broken. It's, we definitely get a weather brief uh, for every flight we do, whether that's us looking up the weather or if we actually have a weather special, special to brief us on the weather. And as we kind of talked about earlier, that's going to be, there, there are considerations for the weather, whether that's in training or uh, in combat and how that's going to affect your tactics. Normally we wouldn't be flying around in full afterburner, like as liberally. Again, it's a huge burn in our, our huge increase in our fuel rate for not the same ratio in terms of uh, thrust that's going to be increased in the aircraft. And there's definitely, if you're going out against service to air sites, there's definitely a prioritization of whether I'm going against air air gun sites or if it's a surface to air missile site. And then within that, whether I'm going after radar sites. And so F-16 has a, uh, a mode in their soft or just a part of their software. It's called auto GCAS or automatic ground collision. When I flew like hundred feet from the ground there, uh, a pretty steep angle, that definitely would have kicked in. And what that's gonna do is prevent you from essentially crashing into the ground or CFIT, which is controlled flight into into terrain. So if the pilot's been incapacitated or gets spatially disoriented, that potentially did there. It's gonna just keep you safe. Now there's a couple of caveats with it that you need to have stuff loaded in the aircraft for um, certain things to enable it, but that's definitely something that F-16s have and uh, we have in the F-35 as well. So you can see the communication up on the uh, top of the screen. There's something like this where it's a large force strike, even in uh, in training, there's a ton of communications going on. You could be monitoring three, four radios at the same time, different frequencies in each radio. So there's a lot of, I don't wanna call it, I wanna say calm jamming, but people who are talking at the same time. So it gets pretty hectic, especially in a fast paced dynamic environment. With a lot of aircraft, a lot of people trying to talk on the radio as you essentially have to now either task shed which radios you're listening to, or just focus specifically on certain frequencies so you'll have a, in the brief or your flight brief, 
it'll be uh, kind of delineate which frequencies you're expected to be up to and at what moments or times you switch to other frequencies. So depending on what type of aircraft you're in and what kind of target solution you have on the aircraft or whether it's a ground object, the onboard systems might take into account that, hey, I'm flying at this speed in this kind of time and space and this aircraft is on this flight path and it might take into account all that for you. If you don't and you just visually pick up the aircraft, then now you have to, essentially like the best example would be your gun in terms of now you have to aim your gun just manually by sight. Uh, you do have, if we get close enough, we should see like the pepper pop up like that. So kind of as I'm just aiming there and hoping that it hits the Apache in that case. For a ground target, it's a lot simpler. Again, even if they're moving, they're moving nowhere near as fast as another airplane. You'll have your whatever onboard system that you're using to track and or find the target. You'll be using that to essentially solve if it's a moving target, if it's a stationary target, especially a ground target. It's gonna, I don't wanna say, say simple, but once you've identified the target, it's significantly easier than a moving target to maintain that target solution on, there, on that target. So most aircraft, you have the ability to fly with night vision goggles. Those definitely provide an increase in uh, situational awareness as you're flying around. They'll allow you to identify, especially at night, you can see lights from significantly further away. Issue with night vision goggles to a certain extent is it limits your uh, peripheral vision. You're looking through kind of like two soda straws. Your depth perception also is reduced pretty significantly. However, in the uh, F-35, we have um, a system called DAS, so Distributed Aperture System. And those are just cameras that are located around the aircraft. And you can enable that vision depending on what type of mission you're executing and how close to either another aircraft you are or a target, it'll have different results. So I got a pull up cue there. Aircraft definitely will tell you to pull up or if you put yourself in that kind of scenario or situation. And if you don't pull up in enough time and you have the auto GCAS enabled in the F-35, it'll actually recover the aircraft for you. So as we talked about generations of fighters, we saw that we were going against these MiG-21s, MiG-21 fish beds, older aircraft. It's significantly older than F-16. If I was flying around an F-16, vice uh, MiG-21, I'm not as, I'm still worried that they can still carry missiles or uh, weapons to engage me, but F-16 is way more of a superior aircraft than a MiG-21, whether that's with its radar, just flight controls, what weapons it can carry, or what weapons systems it has on board and or mission systems. So you could definitely get retasked in a mission as just happened. That's completely realistic, uh, especially like in a combat scenario where, hey, they might not have targets over here, but they're getting reports or you have troops in contact somewhere else. That's completely feasible to maybe not necessarily change up the exact type of mission you're doing, but that you get retasked to somewhere else. Like I would never want to shoot, shoot them down that close. Like I've just flew through that, essentially that aircraft as it fell apart. I've never seen UAVs launch out of a truck like that. There's, depending on the size of the UAV, there's definitely ways, different manners to launch them. There's something that's as simple as a UAV that you could throw like a paper airplane. But again, that's gonna be way smaller than the UAV. It's gonna have a smaller payload, if any payload at all. And then you have UAVs that take off conventionally uh, from a normal airport. Uh, and those are the, the most common. So there's definitely a consideration uh, with mountains, especially if I have cloud covering, and I don't know the exact altitude. The, the simplest would be over water. You, you know exactly that if you fly, you can see your altitude, if you hit zero, you're gonna you know, fly into the water. Where over mountainous terrain, you might be at a higher altitude where your MSL altitude, which is usually displayed uh, what we're seeing now, there's also your radar altimeter where if, you're, if you have an XC at the bank angle or the pitch angle for it, that'll actually provide you your actual altitude over the ground. But your MSL altitude, a good example, would be at Edwards. Our airport elevation's 2,300 feet. So if you're at zero feet above the ground level, you're at 2,300 feet. So if you fly somewhere that's mountainous terrain and you don't, you're not briefed or you haven't done a chart study or if you've got briefed rolled where somewhere where you're not expecting, there's a possibility that Hey, a, a good example would be California. If I'm flying over the Sierra Nevadas and I'm flying over Mount Whitney, which is 14,000 feet MSL, that's a huge jump from sea level of zero or even somewhere like Edwards at 2,300 feet. So just as like you would, for like just like a car engine, if you get higher up in altitude, 
the air gets thinner, uh, performance gets decreased, you just lose turn performance of the aircraft as well. So the higher up in altitude you get, the performance of the aircraft is degraded, whether that's engine thrust or just your maneuverability of the aircraft. There's definitely a consideration to be put into like a missile conservation. So I don't run out of all my weapons. I mean, right now, I'll, I don't even know how many I started with, but I'm down to two and 11, not a lot. And there's definitely a consideration being put into when you're striking targets on the ground uh, with uh, civilian casualties or uh, what weapon you're employing, a potential that, hey, uh, even though I might know that these target coordinates are for, just in this case, hey, we're, we're attacking an airport, but in another, uh, if you're attacking somewhere that would be in a city or in a densely populated area, that there's a potential for them to be civilian casualties. And depending on what type of mission it is, uh, if it's something like this, where it's like a full out outbreak of a war between two countries, the concern about civilian casualties might be less than something that you would see in like Iraq or Afghanistan.